So the reason today that we wanted to do this webinar is because we know exam season is approaching quite soon. And very shortly after that, you're going to be in the season where you need to write your personal statement and you're going to start applying to a medical school in terms of um, in terms of writing your personal statement, doing your UCAT and also your UCAS application. And things can get very busy very quickly. And a key part of writing the personal statement is doing some work experience. Doing work experience used to be difficult before COVID, but after COVID, it's even more difficult to find work experience. And this is a challenge that, I mean, I faced when I applied, but I know that more and more students are facing uh, challenges to find top quality work experience, to give them an insight into the career, as that's what you have to show the admissions tutors uh, in your personal statement to show that you've got an idea of what you're applying for. And that's why we were very passionate about making our own online free work experience course that just gives you an insight into the life of a junior doctor. So my name is uh, Ankit and I'm a foundation year two doctor. I'm currently working in Northwest London and I did, um, I'm an academic foundation doctor, which means that one of my placements was research that I did at Hammersmith Hospital. And today to join us, we've got uh, Paul Andrew, who's head of biology at Long Road Sixth Form, who's got a lot of experience in helping students apply to medical school. So he can give you the idea from a teacher's perspective. We've also got Aya Hamad, who's currently a third year medical student at Hull York Medical School. She applied as an international student and she, uh, during COVID. So she's got uh, going to tell you about which where you can find work experience in some places that you might not have heard of. She'll also introduce you to our course. And then what I want to do with you guys is a focus uh, session on the personal statement where we go through how you can write about your personal statement and understanding what the admissions tutors are looking for. The key thing of today is I want you guys to ask as many questions as possible. The last thing I want is that you come out of today's talk feeling more confused or I wish I'd asked that. I remember applying about eight years ago and I was very nervous, but I want you to treat this as a safe space where feel free to ask any questions. Um, and basically, if you learn, if you take one or two good things from this webinar, you're one step further than you were before. So we're gonna start with Paul um, and I'll ask him to turn on his video and unmute. Um, and he's gonna basically give you an introduction, some introductory advice for work experience from a teacher's perspective. So, Paul, feel free to take it away. Brilliant. Thanks, Ankit. So, yeah, as Ankit said, I'm, I'm a teacher at Longridge Sixth Form College um, and I run the med squad there. And it's it's all about getting students into medicine who are who are suitable for for the for the post, really. Uh, and the biggest thing they ask me is, you know, about work experience. How can I get work experience? So this is what I want to focus my talk on this morning. So can I have the first slide, please, Ankit? Okay, so I was going to take you through these slides, and I know you can read, but I just want to go through them because I've, I've put them together quite carefully. So what is work experience? Now, this is a definition I got when I was on a, a training course for, for teachers for medicine. Any activity or life experience that helps you prepare for medical school. Now, if you think, so most people think, oh, work experience means I've got to do something clinical. No, and if you read that, this, this was written by a medical school. So they're saying even life experiences uh, are valuable as well. Okay. Any experience that relates to an actual medical situation is particularly helpful. So obviously, if you can get work experience in a clinical or care setting, that is the best you can do. Uh, but it depends where you live. You know, if you live in an urban area, that's probably quite easy to do. If you live in a very rural area, then that's that's presumably really quite difficult so uh, be proactive I sometimes get students say to me oh I've looked for work experience and I couldn't find any and then another student says to me oh well I, I was sort of on the phone all day and eventually I got someone to agree to do some work experience so you, you've got to be a bit persistent it's not going to just fall into your lap you've, re, you've actually got to go out there and find it and for me part of getting into medicine is you need to demonstrate things like resilience uh, as a teacher, I am not going to find work experience for you. You've got to do this yourself. You've got to show me you, you can be proactive and you can be resilient. And this is all part of the application process. So there you go. You will find work experience if you really want it. But let's go through some examples. OK, next slide then. Why? 
why why do they want work experience so so what are they looking for look at the top bullet point you've got a realistic insight into medicine and the role of a doctor what's it like to be a doctor i mean you can ask ankit because he is a doctor now but for the rest of us our experience of a, of a doctor is you know going to a gp or something but what's it actually like to be a doctor or or you know to work in so many aspects of medicine go and find out is it actually what you think it is because if it isn't you really do need to know uh second one encourage candidates um but work experience in the environment which is people focused uh, and or care providing if possible so you know if you can do something which is providing care that would be really good um, you've developed the core values and attributes. Now, if you're thinking, what are the core values? The NHS have got a set of core values. Go and look them up. Be proactive. Do not go into a medical interview not knowing the NHS core values because they'll, they'll spot that straight away. Go and find out what these things are. Uh, give you an insight in careers in the NHS. So, you know, being a doctor... Uh, you, uh, Ankit's mentioned research already. Some doctors do a lot of research and not so much clinical. Some doctors do very, very clinical based work. Um, some people go into medicine, they want to be a GP and, that, and that's what they want to do. And this is what we're so short of at the minute is, is thousands of, of GPs. So look into the, the whole thing of being a doctor, but what does that mean in the NHS? Because there's a huge variety of things that that can lead to. And look at the last one, combating attrition. So, so what does that mean? This came from medical school. Attrition is where people drop out of the course. Attrition is where people don't go on to be a medical doctor. So either you drop out during the five years or you get to the end of five years and you say, I've got, I'm a, I'm a doctor, but I'm not going into medicine and you go and do something else. And obviously they want to reduce that because... Um, I was trying to find out how much it costs to train a medical student, and I think I found the answer. It's about a quarter of a million pounds per student. So having invested that much in you as a student, they don't want you walking away. Obviously, you can. Uh, it's completely up to you. But make sure you're, you've looked into it so that the chance of you walking away with a qualification but not going into medicine are low because... Uh, the government's invested a huge amount of money in you and they want you to go on and be a, a medical doctor. Okay, next slide. Um, so here we go. Work experience is an opportunity for aspiring medics to gain insight into the field. There we go. What's it all about? The requirements of the role and the skills needed to succeed. So go away and find out what it's like to actually be a doctor. Do you have those skills? Um, it's not necessarily the work you undertake, um, but it's all about insight into the role, really. So work experiences, find out what the job's all about. Do you have the characteristics that go with it? OK, next slide. I'll come back to work experience in a moment, but what else can you do apart from work experience? Again, these were recommended to me uh, a talk I went to. Um, reading around the subject, so keeping an eye on things changing in healthcare. Um, I mean, BBC website, they've got like a, a medical area. You can just have that on your phone and it'll update you as to changes in, in medical advances as they happen. Um, hot topics in the NHS. So, you know, there's lots of strikes going on in the NHS at the minute. What's that all about? So make sure you know, you're fully aware of these things. COVID as well, of course. Uh, any medical advancements that are going on, which are which are currently on the news. They were talking about uh, last week Alzheimer's. They think there's a couple of drug companies think they've developed drugs to actually um, stop Alzheimer's. I mean, that's the first time that's ever happened. I mean, that's really interesting and uh, potentially very interesting for old people who are heading towards that uh, that sort of condition. Um, Watching relevant content, this is interesting. An Ankit, I know at the minute, is working in A&E. And I don't know, Ankit, if you've watched 24 Hours in A&E, um, it's a documentary thing. It's meant to be, this is what it's like to be in A&E. It'd be quite interesting to know your opinion on that. But uh, us mere mortals don't have that insight. We don't work in medicine. So watch on TV. Don't watch soap operas about medicine. Watch actual documentaries. And I think they can give you at least some insight. Okay, next slide. What 
our, our medical school is looking for in a doctor and so in you. So want students to have commitments, obviously. You, you have to be hugely committed. Uh, I know quite a lot of medical students and the ones who are a bit wobbly and once I've got my five years under my belt, I'm a doctor, I'm probably not going to carry on. Um, it's interesting, they're very different to the ones who, oh, I'm definitely well into this, I'm, I'm going to be a, a medical doctor. The ones who want to be a medical doctor, it pretty much consumes them. It takes up their whole life. And the ones who aren't like that are the ones who are much more uncertain about if they want to do it or not. So for commitment, if, if this passion consumes you about doing medicine, then you're probably well suited to it. If you're kind of, mm, yeah, maybe not sure, it's a great career, but I'm not sure, then maybe it isn't for you. So check it out. Perseverance. So you, you've got to be someone who can who can deal with things going wrong, brush yourself down, get up and go again. So again, can you demonstrate that? Initiative, is that something? Obviously, doctors need a lot of initiative. Can you demonstrate that as well? Concern for others, is that something that is one of your characteristics? Uh, and a massive one, the ability to communicate. You've got to talk to people who you've never met before, i.e. the patients, about very private personal things in a way that they can understand. I, I guess we've all met GPs who are, are very good at this and some who are not so good at it. You've got to be super good at communication and that's probably going to come through more at interview. Okay, next slide. So what kind of characteristics? So you know, when you're putting together a personal statement, what sort of things are we looking for? Or some of these will come up at interview, to be fair. So your motivation to study medicine, that's going to come through on your personal statement. Insight to your own strengths and weaknesses, a personal statement, probably more at interview. Uh, reflecting on your own work, again, personal statement and interview. Personal organisation, personal statement, academic ability. Now, this is your school sending through predicted grades if you are still at school rather than on a gap year. Um, so just something to bear in mind at the end of year 12, some of you may already have had your end of year exams. My students have got theirs in a couple of weeks time. They need to be really good because your teachers need to be predicting you A's or A stars. So don't underestimate that. Don't put all your efforts into work experience and then crash out on your uh, end of year 12 exams. How can a teacher predict you an A or an A star and you've just got a D on the end of your exam? So um, that's something just to bear in mind. You've got to show high academic ability. Problem solving, that'd be an interview. A ability to deal with uncertainty, probably a, a more an interview. Um, risk management, how to deal effectively with, with problems, that would be a personal statement. Honesty, I mean, how can anyone judge that in you? Apart from, you know, if you worked on the tills at Tesco's, presumably Tesco's think you're a pretty honest person. Okay, next slide. Take responsibility for your own actions, personal statement. Uh, being conscientious, again, personal statement. Uh, insight into your own health. Again, that's a personal statement thing. Communication, so partly personal statement and partly what you present at interview. Teamwork, 100% personal statement. You know, are you the captain of the football team or, or um, the coach of the, the junior rowing squad or something? Really important to demonstrate. Um, don't just, oh, yes, I'm very good at teamwork. But what evidence have you got that you're good at teamwork? Treated people with respect, that would be, again, uh, your personal statement. Resilience and the ability to deal with difficult situations. That's a bit of both, actually. A bit of personal statement, a bit of interview. They'll take you out of your comfort zone and see how you deal with it. Empathy and ability to care for others, that, again, will come through your personal statement. Okay, next slide. So how can you demonstrate them? It's your personal experiences, that's, that's the best thing, uh, or from wider reading. Wider reading is good. It's not as good as a personal experience. One of my students this year, uh, in her year 13, she was predicted all A's at A-level. Um, she got a decent UCAS score, uh, up near sort of averaging 600, uh, sorry, near, near 700. Uh, 
got a couple of interviews, no offers for medicine at all. She was absolutely devastated, but she wanted to, to go for it again. And so she took a gap year and worked at our local hospital in, in Cambridge, which is Adam Brooks. Um, and I spoke to her a couple of weeks ago. She's got four offers for medicine this year. She got none last year, four offers for medicine. And she said, uh, please tell your students the advice from me, take a gap year, work as a healthcare assistant, and an interview, when they ask you stuff, you draw on those experiences you've had being a healthcare assistant. And she said it's made a world of difference. She did improve her UCAT score, I must say. It went up a lot as well. Um, so from her experience, taking a gap year can be hugely beneficial. Of all the students I've taught, everyone who's taken a gap year and applied in their gap year has got into medicine. They find it easier to get in during their gap year because they can bring in those personal experiences, particularly if you've worked in a healthcare situation, having left school. Okay, next slide. Just some examples of work experience. So, so like, what are we talking about? So the first one, caring things, volunteering. Volunteering's thought to be a good thing to do. Like what? Care home or hospice, if there's one near where you live. If not, is there a food bank, a scout group, a sports club? Can you work as a healthcare assistant? I think you lot are old enough now that you can do that. Uh, is there a local nursery, an SEN school you can go and work at? That looks really, really good. What about a first aid thing like St. John's Ambulance or something? That, that Again, all of those would come across really well. Okay, next slide. Online work experience. And this is what I was talking to Ankit about when he said that, that he was going to produce this virtual work experience course. I said, do you realize there's a huge gap out there? The only ones that I can find, and when I've been to talks for um, teachers about medicine, the only two that have ever been mentioned at these talks are Brighton and Sussex Medical School do an online work experience. And there's something called Observe GP. And I've just popped the links in there. So those are the only two online work experiences that any of us can find. And what Ankit and the Intermed people are saying is, OK, we'll we'll put a course for you then. So I think this is incredible. Absolutely amazing. So there we are. There, there is some online work experience. Why not do all of these things? Why not do all three and, and get the most out of it? OK, next slide. You might recognize yourself here uh, working on the till at Tesco's, working behind the, a bar. Uh, is that valuable? 100% yes, it is. I've not worked on the tills at Tesco's, but talking to my students who have, they tell me how the general public can be absolutely lovely, super amazing people, or they can be the rudest, most horrible people you ever meet. And I'm sure it's the same for the, the guy working in a bar. I'm sure Ankit can tell us when he's being a doctor and he's in A&E and &E and it's two in the morning and the drunks are all being dragged in. Um, he gets a lot of abuse, I imagine. And, and it could be verbal and it could be physical. And he's got to be able to deal with that. So the fact that you've worked on the tills dealing with horrible people is massively good experience for working as a doctor dealing with some horrible patients. So, yeah, the, all these things do not underestimate them. Massively important. And the sports teams, if you know, if you are captain of your junior rowing team, that is huge uh, in terms of medical application because you demonstrate so many of the characteristics when you unpick that role that they're looking for in a doctor. So do not underestimate these things. Hugely, hugely valuable. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm nearly done then. So these are the, the big take home messages from me. So do self reflect. So anything you experience, work experience, um, write it all down, keep a journal, whether it's in a care home or on the tills at Tesco's and reflect on that experience and how it made you feel. Keep track of everything that sticks out. So anything which is a little bit unusual, think, oh, yes, that's that's worth a note, isn't it? Because that was that was interesting to observe. Was it about some special case or some meaningful story about a patient or a medical emergency? How did how was that managed? How was the doctor talking to the patient? Um, one of my students was present when a when a doctor was telling a, a patient that they had cancer. Uh, and how did the doctor deal with that? Bearing in mind, patients will respond very differently in that situation. Write all that down. Um, the positives of the profession, of course, keep a note of those. Uh, we won't say negatives, we'll say challenges as well. Um, how do they make you feel? 
do some research, read your books, go online and be proactive. Um, do not sit and wait for things to come your way. You've got to go out and find them. If you don't go out and find them, then you're just going to miss out and everyone else will just run past you and they'll get all the all the posts at, at med school. So that's it from me. Good luck with your application. I will be around all morning if you want to ask me any more questions, but that's it for me. Thank you very much. We've done these a few times. It's always good to get the perspective of a teacher because um, you can give us advice that maybe we don't see uh, as we're in it. And you've coached so many students through this that you obviously pick up on the patterns and what works um, and the type of students that are likely to get in. Um, so I said, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat now, but we'll also save them or, or you can save them to the end. So that was our introductory section on work experience, where we saw the what is it, the definition, the importance of it. And I think uh, Paul has demonstrated that it's not just ticking boxes for your personal statement, gaining that insight and that maturity and exposure to the world of medicine will ultimately develop your answers for the interview as well. And it's very obvious for medical admissions tutors to see who actually does have a realistic concept. Because a lot of there's such a shortage of doctors and a lot are leaving the profession or moving abroad, there's so much pressure to basically make sure that you are they are accepting the right type of people who are dedicated to the profession. So the work experience and you, the way you talk about it is becoming more and more important. What we're now going to cover is, um, I, I is going to cover some specific advice on the work experience um, about which, um, about resources that you might not know of, other online resources, and importantly, how you can talk about it as well. And then she's also going to go through our work experience course, which has showed you how we've tried to give you a bit more of an insight into what a junior doctor is. Um, I think some questions has come through. We'll save those to after this session. Um, and before uh, I take over for the final session. So Aya, do you want to take us away? Thank you, Ankit. Hi, everyone. My name is Aya. I'm a third year medical student at the Holyoke Medical School. Um, and I'll be walking you through some specific advice for getting good work experience, especially virtually. Um, so when we're talking about relevant work experience, I like to divide it into three main categories. So three main ways you can talk about it. So having a reflective diary of what's happening in the news and online that's something that you don't need to arrange work experience for that's just having an awareness of the world around you in particular around health and medicine and public health and that shows a lot of interest in medicine and a dedication to the career beyond just the basic things that everyone will be doing um, and reflection is the key part of talking about work experience which I'll talk about a bit later um, the second thing is making use of online resources. So as much as COVID-19 made it really difficult for everyone to get in-person work experience, it also opened up a variety of opportunities for us to gain some insight or the equivalent of work experience through online resources, which um, one of them is, for example, our new work experience course. Um, volunteering online or in your local community, now that COVID restrictions are gone, um, is a very good way to also get work experience um, in a way that might not be directly clinical, but it gives you such a good insight into working with people and the skills that it requires to be a good doctor that are beyond just being in a clinical environment. Next slide, please. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was what having a reflective diary would mean. Um, healthcare professionals have been posting online about their experiences of working during the pandemic and after the pandemic. And um, there was a huge surge of um, online healthcare professionals who have social media platforms where they share their experiences. And I think that's a very good way of getting some, an insight, a personal one, um, into the life of a doctor and understanding um, what that would mean um, on a personal level and their experiences, what they share, because a lot of doctors have a, many shared experiences. Um, listening to what they have to say and reflecting on it for your own experiences and what you would want to see yourself doing in the future. And obviously making sure to remember that some social media resources 
are more reliable than others. Um, now, there are websites that I think are quite reliable for getting a bit of an awareness about the health um, care profession, kind of what's happening in the news and outside of that and the current kind of issues that are being dealt with on the day today for the NHS and beyond. So, for example, we have newspapers such as the Guardian Science page, the Telegraph's health page. Uh, the British Medical Journal, Journal has an open access um, page with a lot of information about the medical profession and allied medical health professions, professions as well. Um, now, TED Talks are a great way for you to gain a much deeper insight into a certain topic, and often they have information about health topics and uh, current things and issues that are happening in the news, which is, again, really important to keep up with because it shows awareness and an interest in the, in the current climate. And that's really important for a healthcare professional to do because we have to always stay updated and up to date on everything that is happening. Um, science and health related content on Twitter, you can take with a grain, quick, like a grain of salt, but um, it's really good for quick updates and things that are currently happening as Twitter is very much up to date with everything. Um, next slide, please. Um, so once you've looked at a few of those kinds of um, resources that are just for your own benefit in reading, you can take reflections on those, take notes of things you're interested in and talk about them and um, kind of expand on what you want to learn more about, what you might want to ask questions about later so that you can use it as something to look back on during your interviews and personal statement. However, now these resources that I'm going to tell you about are a bit different. They're much more, um, they're much more passive in the sense that you are now going to be involved in watching something or being um, told information about what it's like working as a doctor. So those are virtual work experiences, um, things that you would be the equivalent of going in um, to your local GP practice, for example. So we have the Brighton and Sussex Medical School free virtual work experience course and that explores several different medical specialties and it shows you it gives you a really good broad idea of what it's like um, work, working as a doctor in the NHS. Um, the Royal College of General Practitioner, Practitioners has a really good interactive platform that's called Observe GP and this one highlights many different aspects of working in primary care so it's very much uh, designed um, by the Royal College uh, for you to know what it's like be, to be a GP. And that is a very, very important aspect of being a healthcare professional. It's usually the first step into understanding the whole uh, healthcare profession. Um, the NHS Health Careers website also provides insight into different careers and specialties. It's not necessarily work experience, but it's a really good resource to use to look up things that are uh, that might interest you. And now the Virtual Medical Society, Socially distant, Distanced Shadowers and Web Shadowing are all different platforms that allow you to have some sort of uh, virtual work experience. So whether that be follow a doctor around through a webinar or a virtual doctor talk about their day-to-day. -day. Um, and I think all of them are really good. And you as an individual should look at all of them, see what works for you. And most importantly, once you choose to do a few of them, make sure you're engaging well, make sure you're taking notes of things that are resonating with you. You have to reflect on those experiences because as much as work experience is a tick box uh, for medical schools, what once that's done the way you talk about it is what matters it doesn't actually matter what you did for work experience or uh, how much you have of it as long as you have some insight but the most important thing is how you speak about it because if you're able to reflect on those experiences that you've had um, as a medical applicant and know what that would mean for you moving forward that's what medical schools are looking for it's having a depth of reflection that shows the maturity that they need uh, for a future doctor and finally, we have our intimate vir virtual work experience course, which I will talk about very shortly. Um, and I think the next slide, please, um, for our final bit. So we have volunteering, which I think is one of the most 
underrated work, forms of work experience that there is. Most of the work experience that I did that wasn't virtual was volunteering. Um, as I was applying during the pandemic and as an international student with different rules and regulations regarding going into practices. So volunteering formed a lot of what I was able to talk about and reflect on during my interviews, especially. Um, and I thought that was really valuable because when you're volunteering, you're interacting with people, you're meeting the local population and you're working with others, which are really important experiences that make up a lot of what a doctor actually does. Um, it's a lot of communication skills, like Paul had mentioned. So um, all forms of volunteering can really be helpful, even if they're not health related. Of course, having a health related one can help, um, but it's not necessary at all. It's about having a caring or a service role, a role that you are volunteering for that might help you draw on some experience to then talk about in your work experience, um, about as your work experience during your interviews and personal statement. Um, look, look at your local community. That's the first step to start on. And then you can look at online local communities as well. If you can't find anything within your local sphere, you can also look at websites that have um, volunteering opportunities such as Do It, Nextdoor and the British Red Cross. There's so many more depending on the local charities you've got. So that is something that you can easily try to look up depending on where you live. Um, but here are some starting points. And now I think we're going to talk you through our virtual work experience course. So we decided that it, there was such a lack of work experience courses that show you the day-to-day -day life of a junior doctor, where, which is actually what you're training to be. Uh, when we're in med medical school, all we're training to be for now is junior doctors, to be a good junior doctor. And having an insight into what a junior doctor does in, in a day's work is really important because it gives you an idea of what your life would look like right after med school. And it's really important for us to understand um, the basics of their communication skills and interacting with patients and how you actually talk to a patient and take a history from them when they first present. Um, so as you can see, our work experience course is divided into a few sections. We have sections like understanding the role, how to take a history and conducting an examination. We also wanted to give you an insight into investigations for how a doctor would form a plan and how they would discharge them. And here's an example of a video um, clip from the actual course. Can you guys hear it? It's the link you can. Exam were essentially normal. From looking at the patient's history and examination, it appears that our patient has picked up an infection. We can now do particular investigations to see if this is definitely the case and find out where it is coming from. So we see Dr. Enkit, um, as a uh, F2 actually interacting with a simulated patient and we work through a case with him throughout this course, besides actually getting a few, a lot of information below the video where you can actually understand the key concepts that we might want you to kind of have an idea of um, going into medical school. Sure, Aya, thank you very much um, for your session. It was really informative. And I hope you um, all found that, that, I hope you appreciated that there's so many different resources available for medical applicants, whether that be online or not. And um, we've tried to create an, an additional one that actually shows you what it is like to do a ward or an on-call duty as a junior doctor. And at the end, I'll talk to you a bit more uh, through it um, about what we did in the course. So the final session of this small webinar is that now that we've covered the work experience, uh, I can see a lot of questions in the chat have been about, well, how do I write about my work experience? Do I just uh, list it? Or I need to write about qualities. Do I just write down this list? So before, in order to answer those questions, a really helpful way is to actually understand what the admissions tutors are looking for. So that's what we're going to cover, because if you can understand those, 
then when you start writing your personal statement, you'll be able to write it in a way that you know is ticking off all the boxes without sounding like a list. The key thing that differentiates a good applicant from a poor applicant in their personal statement is having a sense of flow. I read lots of personal statements, which are just like, I did this, I did this. But by doing that, one, it gets very boring and it makes it seem like you're only doing it to tick a box. On the other hand, if you understand the reasons why you're doing it and you explain it in good detail, it makes it seem like you genuinely are interested and you're a very motivated student. And that's the type of person that uh, medical students want um, to bring into their medical schools. So this is actually the last year of the personal statement. Next year, they're changing it, but the principles are still going to be very much the same. So what is a personal statement? You might have started writing it now or you might wait till after your exams. But anyways, it's a good idea to have this in the back of your head. A personal statement is defined as your opportunity to sell yourself to your prospective school, college or training provider. It's 4,000 characters, which is only about 500 to 600 words. That's not very much at all. It's very easy to go well above that. And then you have to start cutting it down and taking things out of the personal statement. And this will form the basis of your admissions interview. So the key thing in a personal statement is that it's not just an essay. If you just write about different things that you've done, it's very hard. In the personal statement, I like to think of you have to cover a spectrum of things from your academics, research and work experience, all the way to other qualities such as leadership, extracurricular activities. And then on top of that, after you've successfully done all of that, you have to put your own unique criteria because otherwise your statement is going to sound the same as everyone else's. And that is actually a very difficult skill to do because you might find that your personal statement is way too biased on this side or this side, or you're just writing about all these things, but it all seems very bland. Like, why are you actually doing it? So in this activity, and I want it to be quite interactive. I want you to try and think of, you know, what qualities universities are looking to see. So I want everyone to put into the chat the top three qualities that you think a doctor needs to be um, and allow those two to filter through. So if you were a medical um, school, um, what's the top three qualities that you want to cover in your personal statement? And let's see the different answers that we get in the chat. We're having some in the Q and A. Okay, so in, in the I can see things coming into the Q and A now. Um, so we've got dedicated, empathy, um, well-rounded, resilient, empathetic, and communication skills. Okay. Let's see what else there is. Working well under pressure. That's very nice. Um, teamwork, leadership. Okay, now th these are very good qualities. All right. So, so far, I'm not sure if people can see the Q&A. Um, we have uh, dedication, empathy, well-rounded, resilient, empathetic, good communication skills, leadership, someone who never gives up, multitasking. Every time I, uh, when we do this um, session and I ask students, uh, what they think the most important qualities are. These are always the same ones that we get. Empathy, hardworking, aware of morals in the workplace. Okay, so, so far, if we look at the type of doctor that you've described, you've got someone who's resilient, who's empathetic, good communication skills, working well under pressure, someone who never gives up, multitasking, hardworking, all of that, a good team player. And... As you can see, I've basically summarized those here. You know, your suitability for medicine, ability to work with others, ethical awareness, honesty, and integrity, communication. These are all the qualities that you've said. However, looking through this, I can see that you missed out probably, well, arguably the most important quality that a doctor needs to have. 
that so far I haven't seen in the chat or the answers. So I'm going to give you another attempt to say, what do you think is the one quality that you've all missed out that is not covered in this list? And you can put it in the Q&A or the chat so that the correct answer hasn't been said yet, actually. Okay, so we've had communication. So, so that's actually still, it. that's in the list. Someone's mentioned that. Problem solving. Okay, I mean, yes, you do have to be problem solving. Um, if you could expand on that a bit, that could help. Um, so I'm going to read out names. So Neva said resilience. I think I'm going to put resilience with mot well, motivations already mentioned. Spontaneous to an extent. I, I think actually... That is important, but as a junior doctor, especially, you probably will be performing, you know, what people tell you to do. Caring, well, I'm gonna put caring and empathy in the same box, it's too similar. Confidence, I put that in communication. Passionate, passion for the career, I'm gonna put that in motivation. Initiative, similarly with spawn. So I'm gonna give you one last go to, there's, there's the key answer that people still haven't um, answered. That And I think this is the key thing that people miss out in their personal statements that helps provide that flow and differentiates standard medical applicants from people who truly understand what it is to be a doctor. Ethical awareness. Well, we've got ethical there. Courage. I mean, you don't have... To, I, I think it's important, but you don't have, you're not becoming a fighter. Um, conscientiousness. I'll put that in, you know, honesty and integrity. Personal experience. Well, I think the whole thing is personal experience. I'm going to allow three more answers before I tell you what, what I think is very important. Sleepless nights. Okay. You will probably have a lot of sleepless nights, but I, I wouldn't say that's the most important quality. Is there anyone finally want to give one more attempt at what they think is missing? Just, just think about it from this. So if, if you imagine this doctor in front of you, they are empathetic, they're motivation, they're they've got good communication skills, they're very honest, they're ethically aware, they're very good at working in the team. And, you know, they understand the values of the NHS and they're very dedicated. They can do sustained and intense work. Okay. So the one thing that I think everyone has missed so far is that if you look at this person who we've described, it's a very nice person. They're, they're very empathetic. They can speak to you well. They're very caring. They work in a team. However, if you think about the application steps to medical school and what you have to do to get through to the degree, you have to probably get about two to three A stars in your A levels. You have to do well in your GCSEs. There's a UCAT to do, a BMAT if you're applying to some medical schools. These are very tough tests. So the one thing that you haven't mentioned at all in your personal statement or in these characteristics is basically being smart and intelligent. There's a lot of people can be very nice, but not everyone can sit those exams. Not everyone can memorize hundreds of drug names, all their side effects, can understand the different investigations to do. And so what I put this in is academic potential. Someone did mention problem solving, and I just wanted them to expand on it a little bit more. The key thing is this second one, that intellectual curiosity. As a doctor, it is lifelong learning. I've done six years of medical school. I've also done two sets of professional exams. And at every stage of the process to get to the next level, there's more and more exams which become harder and harder. And they know that, unfortunately, a lot of people, it might just be too difficult for them. So you have to show that you are intellectually curious. And by having this quality in your personal statement, it, it provides a reason to do all the things. That's why you're doing the work experience. That's why you might be reading that book or attending that conference, because you are genuinely keen to learn about this fascinating career, whether it's about the science or about the interaction with patients. And that is the one thing that I have found has can provide the flow in your personal statement. So now we have a list of what you know admissions tutors are looking for. You all knew that, um, that this list is very important. And I think a lot of people know that you have to demonstrate these qualities. 
But if you can align them with these qualities in your personal statement, you're going to sound like a much stronger and well-rounded candidate. So the question I now pose to you is, yes, we have this list of qualities that we need to demonstrate, but how can you actually demonstrate this? If I told you and you'd never met me before, I'm very, you know, I'm very intellectually curious. I've got great communication skills. I'm very empathetic and I'm a good team player. Would you believe me? And the answer is no. So how are you going to show this? And the way you show this is evidence. And that is where all these other things come in. So again, I want you to put in the chat the different pieces of evidence that you think you can put into your personal statement to demonstrate some of these qualities. And if you can provide an example, what quality you think it shows, that's one step above. Um, but just state the different things that you think you can put in that can show in. Okay, so reflections on experiences. Yes, yeah, so that's good. The reason why, yep. Yeah. Certificates from work experience. Yep, yeah. certificate like medical, exactly. So work experience is one. And now this is where the work experience comes in. You are not just doing work experience to tick it off for a box. It has to be directly linked to one of those qualities that you are trying to demonstrate or a quality that you've seen someone else uh, do and you understand that it's important for a doctor so obviously work experience is um one i've had a very interesting question is how can we mention our academic credential in my health without being seen as arrogant and you're going to see that the way you do it is through pieces of evidence the next one is as some reason why reason to study medicine if your reason was that you saw you know you had a personal experience with a family member who was ill you saw the way um, doctors were dealing with him. That again is more evidence that you've seen the qualities required as a doctor. Volunteering, Aya has mentioned, um, that's very important. And now some of the other things that I'm going to show you can also demonstrate that academic potential without sounding arrogant. And that is stuff like reading. People will know if you do read books and you don't just say, I did it because someone told me to, that in itself shows that you are actively reading around a subject and the reason you're doing that is because you want to find out more. You don't need to say, I read this book, therefore I'm academically brilliant. It's inferred in the way that you do it. The next is academic interest. And that is things like attending conferences, go listening to talks, listening to speakers who, are, who excel in their field. And again, by doing that, you're showing that you're interested. And then Obviously, the other piece of evidence is extracurricular activities. Paul mentioned that even if you work in a bar, you're picking up different skills. Similarly, if you're the captain of a football team, maybe you're developing leadership skills. If you're in a sports team, by being in a team, by definition, you're you've got good, uh, you're developing your teamwork skills by playing, you know, a musical instrument and carrying that on alongside your studies. You've got organization skills and you've got dedication. So that's the way you're, if you're matching your different experiences or pieces of evidence to that list of qualities, that's then how you're starting to provide a little bit of flow. So again, we've got this piece of evidence. We've got the list of qualities. Now, the final question is, a lot of people will do that. And that's just the basics. How can you take your personal statement to the next level? And I'm just going to share this with you. So there's four ways that I felt you can do it and truly distinguish yourself from other students. So the first is research. Now, a lot of people are very scared of research or they don't really understand what it is, especially at your level. No one is asking you to find the next vaccine for COVID or find the cure to cancer. Research simply means synthesizing information that might be there putting it together and coming up to your to a new conclusion this can be a literature review it can be something as simple as looking up different hand washing techniques presenting that to your class that this is the best you actively research in your own time and you come up to a new conclusion when i was applying to medical school i did an epq an extended project qualification and my question was is chess ability linked to intelligence and for that, it was very simple. I did an experiment with eight friends where I organized a chess tournament. So I put them in, and I could rank how good their chess ability was in order. And then I gave them an IQ test. And I basically did a very simple correlation to see, is it linked? 
And I found a, a, a small link between intelligence or IQ of the right side of the brain and chess ability. And I put that in my EPQ. Now, is that true? Probably not, because my sample size was only eight. And there were probably a lot of flaws in my experiment. But that's what they talk, spoke about in my Cambridge interview. And they were very interested to see how I'd come to that conclusion. And just by doing that, I had shown that, you know, I am academically curious. And it is something that differentiated me from others. The next thing is travel. Now, we couldn't have done this two years ago, but now that everything has opened up, and this is directly linked to the third, the NHS is one healthcare system. It is not the only healthcare system in the world. If you go to other countries, I'm sure you will appreciate the NHS a lot more, but you'll also find flaws in it and how it probably is very inefficient. So if you can do some work experience abroad, you have that ability to directly compare different healthcare systems. And it's like, you only know if you like one ice cream flavor, if you've tried all the rest. Similarly, in terms of this, you'll get a much better understanding of the NHS, the flaws, how it's good, how it's bad. If you can share how you might compare it with another country. I did some work experience in India, and that was really fascinating because India is a, mostly a private healthcare system. And although some patients find it very easy to get a CT or an MRI scan done on the same day and see a specialist, there's a lot of the population who can't afford access to healthcare. And you can see the ethical implications of that. And then the final piece of the puzzle, and this is where you're not going to sound arrogant, this is where you're going to get that flow, is linking together your work experience, reading, and academics. And this is how you can show you're academically curious without even stating it. By saying that you did some work experience, for example, if you observed a surgeon, let's say, doing an orthopedic surgery, after that, you then went and read a book about it, and then you followed up that surgeon or someone related by going to their conference talking about new surgical techniques. Just by doing that, you've demonstrated about 10 qualities all in one, and they basically led from one another. That's showing it's like a journey. You're learning along the way. You are very academically curious. But of course, in order to be able to do that in your personal statement, you actually have to have some work experience on there whether that be in person or whether like our course you want to, you can do it online. So the key points to take away from this session is that medicine is great, but it is difficult. And the earlier you start your preparation, the easier you will find it and try to think like an admissions tutor would. So going from there onto our work experience course, the key point and Aya and uh, I have made this course together, is that there are some other online work experience courses that will give you general advice about the profession and what it is. But the, the one thing that we thought were lacking was directly almost shadowing me interacting with a patient. And from there, by taking a history, I hope you can appreciate, you can say you've developed the communication skills and, you know, that empathy on how to listen to a patient and ask key questions. In terms of the medical examination, I think this is where you learn the importance of prioritization that doctors need to do. Um, and basically, you're not expected to know or to learn any of these by the time of your interview. That's what medical school is for. But you will be able to say that you've seen a doctor actively taking a full A to E examination of a patient and which areas are the most important to um, work on. Then in terms of investigations, this is where you'll learn. That here I've tried to... Um, bring across the point of cost benefit analysis. You cannot do every single investigation on a patient because you're limited by time and resources. And also some investigations might be harmful for a patient. Just remember every x-ray that you have is giving the patient radiation, which slightly increases their risk of cancer. So for as a junior doctor, you also need to think, okay, at this point, how rational am I gonna be? And it's basically thinking about it in a systematic approach. And then forming a management plan, this is where you need to appreciate the value of teamwork. As first year or second year doctors, you're not expected to make the management plan all, all by yourself because you don't have that experience. But here we cover how you can present it to your senior to ask for help. And then most importantly, closing the loop, going back to the patient and informing them um, of your plan to make sure that they understand and addressing any concerns that they might have. And 
by doing this course, um, you will also be able to download a certificate of completion. And when you write about it in your personal statement, our course is also affiliate affiliated with and designed by Woos Hill Medical Center, which is a GP practice, and they've had good input into the creation of this course. So you will be able to write in your uh, personal statement that it, you did it in affiliation with this uh, GP practice. So it sounds, you know, more uh, well, uh, leg leg legitimate or, you know, it's a proper piece of work experience that is associated with a, uh, a GP practice. There is a small admin fee for our uh, for our certificate. You don't have the course. The entire course itself is free. But if you want to download the certificate, there is an admin fee. But if you do download that, you'll then you can then use that ten pounds off any other course on Intimed. And if you have enjoyed our teaching style or the level of depth that we go into after this course, do check out some of our courses on our site. They are taught by myself. And this is where I go into more detail on how to, you know, a full personal statement course, how to write about these in your personal statement, and then a UCAT course with a question bank, or if you're applying for BMAT universities, we've also got a BMAT, question, uh, BMAT course as well. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We've all been in that situation before. And so the final thing I would say is that, you know, we have, we did manage to record this. We would love it if you are able to give us a review based on this. It always helps getting feedback because it helps us know what to cover next time. If there's any bits that we've missed or if we're doing a good job, we'll do more of the same and continue creating more resources like this. So this, is, this is the QR code. And if you could leave us a Trustpilot review, then we'll be able to send you a recording of today's webinar as well. It might just take a few days for us to upload it and edit it. But if you do want a recording, um, then you can um, just leave us a Trustpilot review. I'm just going to invite the other two speakers back. Um, and if you have any questions for the next five to 10 minutes, we can go through those. But thank you very much for attending. It is a Saturday morning. Um, and I think you've all proven that you are all dedicated just by being here. So if anyone has any questions, um, then we can then and feel free to ask now. I think there is a question for you, Ankit. By being a doctor, will you still be able to do other things in life or does it take all your life? Uh, yes. And while I answer that, I, I think, would you be able to just put the link to the, um, for the thing into the chat so people can leave a review if they're on their website, if they're on their computers? Yes. I mean, yes, you definitely can have a life definitely at medical school and even as a doctor there you, you can there will be rotations that are much easier and more work-life balanced uh currently i'm working in a and e which is very difficult and the hours are very unsociable so i have had to write off a couple of months but still there is always time alongside medicine in my spare time i still like going out with my friends i've obviously still got enough time to do this and create a work experience course with aya and uh run a business on the side um and uh, also do some DJing in my spare time and play sport but the key is just being organized but if you've had the experience of getting through medical school you'll learn how to do it and you, you definitely can have a life how, how does a medical school timetable look for one two three four five I think that's a very long question to answer so um it does depend on the medical school that you go to um, usually, so I went to Cambridge, where for the first two years, it's very lecture based, and you probably would have lectures, you know, most of the day in the morning, and then some sessions in the afternoon, but nine to five, the weekends were off, and then you'd be, you know, working outside those hours. Once you get into the clinical years, you're on placement, and you basically are trying to live like a junior doctor. Um, so it is you, a lot of medical schools are sign in where they expect you to be on the wards for about nine to five. Um, and then you have lecture weeks as well. How could you talk about specific cases you've observed? So as long as you're not mentioning any names, date of birth, or patient identifiable information, you'll be fine. So just generalize it. You can say a middle-aged uh, woman with this or an elderly gentleman with that. And um, that should help maintain confidentiality. How long does it actually take you to recognize as a doctor? So 
as soon as you finished, you graduated from medical school, you will be a doctor. Uh, so that's five years or six years. For some of the schools, I fit the widening participation scheme. I think I'll, I'll ask Paul about that. You might know more about that. Yeah, and no, that's a really good answer. The med schools definitely are looking to widen participation. Um, so I think that's an advantage, really. I mean, things like, you know, if your parents haven't been to university uh, or you live in a postcode, which is a very deprived area, if you go to a school which is not a high achieving school, it's just a bog standard school, uh, all these things can can really help. Uh, and remember, if you're um, financially uh, sort of difficult at home where the money's really, really tight, things like UCAT um, will be free to you. If you apply to UCAT for special consideration for financial reasons, it's all free. So yeah, it, it, it's not a disadvantage and, and med schools are definitely looking to wider participation. Uh, can I just also say, Ankit, about the, the, the um, personal statement thing, that some students get hung up on the personal statement and they think, if I, if I write a really good personal statement, that's it, I'm done. No, <laughs> that's just part of it. Most med schools, when I talk to them, say we only read the personal statement once we've offered an interview. So you've got to get the interview first before the personal statement then kicks in. How do you get an interview? By getting really good grades at A-level or really good predictions at A-level, and then UCAT and BMAT. Um, BMAT, I don't know if you know this, Ankit, but BMAT is finishing this year. Uh, yeah. That is the end of it. Um, I've asked what they're going to do instead, and no one's got a clue what they're going to do instead. So I guess Cambridge will just do UCAT for the time being. Uh, but there is one more year of UCAT and BMAT. So make sure your, you know, your end of year exams are really good. Your UCAT or BMAT is fantastic. Uh, then the personal statement will kick in at interview. Yeah, so I think it's important to pick up on that, that this is the last year of the BMAT. The UCAT is still going on. And although the BMAT is a hard exam, you should really take advantage of that because because it's been um, out for so long, people have developed really good strategies for it. When a new course comes, it's everyone's going to be in the dark and basically have to look for new ways. So that's why on, on our website, we've got courses which go through specific tried and tested strategies on how to maximize those scores and we've got question banks to help you prepare for this so I really would take advantage and if you can do well in those tests do well in it this year because next year we don't know what the situation is going to be and it might be a much more difficult test and you're not going to have those resources to help you Uh, is there any final questions? I'm not going to answer specific questions on the BMAT because I think we could get into a whole uh, new thing and spend a lot of time on that. A lot of information is available on Intermed and you can find that information about all the courses and try free lessons as well.